I'm sure it was some holy bishop or some man of renown from the number of the faithful that I saw borne to heaven in the splendor of that great light and escorted by so many bands of angels. When morning came, he learned that Aidan, bishop of the church of Lindisfarne, had entered the kingdom of heaven at that very time. Cuthbert at once delivered the flocks he was tending and presented himself to the monastery, founded by Aidan at Old Melrose on the Tweed. And the gates were opened wide to receive him. This also marks Cuthbert's entry into religious life. It also started a journey that was to continue way after his death. We don't know anything about Cuthbert's parentage. In the late 12th century, the monks of Durham very ingeniously tried to foist on him an Irish royal parentage, but that is demonstrably nonsense. We simply don't know who his parents were. We are told by the early lives that when Cuthbert arrived at Melrose to become a monk, he was riding on a horse, carrying a spear, accompanied by a servant. And those are not the marks of a shepherd boy, but rather of a Northumbrian aristocrat. So that it seems to me we can be pretty confident that Cuthbert was of aristocratic extraction, just like all the other churchmen from Northumbria in the 7th and 8th centuries that we know anything about. One of Aidan's great achievements was to lay down a network of monasteries throughout Northumbria which could serve as missionary centres. By the time Cuthbert was a mature person, uh, these were still operating as missionary centres, but sometimes in conflicting groups. There had been foundations of various types in Northumbria in Dea Rambanissia. And so by this time, it was no longer the missionary thought, but actually getting the doctrine straight and um, deciding on the organization of a church that was now well established in Northumbria. Cuthbert traveled widely, and his reputation as a healer and a counselor quickly spread. But all was not well with the Northern Church. The Irish tradition under Aidan was coming under increasing pressure from the Roman tradition, which was practiced elsewhere in the country. Finally, in 664 AD, King Oswey called for an end to all the arguments. The differences were to be settled one way or another at a great synod. The venue chosen was Whitby. When the most momentous decision had to be made in the church in 664, namely what organization the church should follow, this debate took place here at Whitby and Hild organized it. Now, this debate was to see whether the Continental Church and the Kentish Church and its organization uh, was to prevail. And really it turned, as so many Christian things do, unfortunately, on matters of um, custom, where, how people wore their tonsure, but more importantly, when Easter was to be celebrated, and that's a method of calculation. The Celtic Church from Iona had celebrated Easter on one date and the Kentish Church and Continental Church on another. And this was resolved here in a great synod at which the king presided. What prevailed actually was the Continental form of calculation. I myself think that it, this is one of the points at which people can attempt to make far too much of, of, the, of the story. I think that the outcome of the Synod of Whitby was a foregone conclusion. If it had not happened then, it would have happened very soon afterwards. So I don't see a lot of significance. I don't think that there was that much difference between the Irish approach and the continental approach. And um, I think people have played this up to um, emphasize differences in approaches to Christianity which are much more recent in origin than the period we're thinking of. Cuthbert was certainly influenced by the Irish church which Aidan had introduced into Northumbria. The monastery where he became a monk, Melrose, was founded under the Irish influence, particularly of the Church of Iona. When Irish methods, particularly of calculating Easter, were abandoned in Northumbria after the Synod of Whitby in 664, Cuthbert evidently conformed to the new Roman influence practices. So in that sense, he began as an Irish Celtic churchman and modified uh, to the new practices of Northumbria after 664. The outcome of the Synod of Whitby was not welcomed by everyone. 
Coleman, having lost the debate for the Celtic Church, returned to Iona. Cuthbert was then sent to the Abbey on Lindisfarne as prior, second in command, and there started his great association with the Holy Island. Cuthbert's job was to set the monastery back on its feet again, after the departure of so many monks who left with Coleman. Although schooled in the Celtic Church, Cuthbert then embraced Roman Orthodoxy and became a kind of linchpin, a bridge, if you like, between these two great traditions. I think to understand Cuthbert's spirituality, one has to realize he stands in a Christian tradition which goes back for several centuries. I would say it's starting in the deserts of Egypt in the third or fourth century. Here people go into the desert, partly to meet, or primarily to meet God, but also partly to enjoy the solitude and to fight with the demonic powers which have been driven out of the Christian city and have taken refuge in the desert wastes. This is the tradition which St. Aidan brought to Lindisfarne, where Cuthbert was trained. Cuthbert was drawn to a more solitary life, so he began on an island next to the monastery. But his fame attracted a lot of visitors, so following in the footsteps of Aidan, he looked towards the other Farne Islands. It was here, on Inner Farne, that Cuthbert set up his own hermitage. It was here that he learned to live very close to the earth, the sea, and the sky, in the harsh Irish tradition. But it was here that Cuthbert became almost as one with God's creation. Cuthbert lived at a time when a major part of Christian's thinking was the idea of a spiritual warfare, a war between God and the forces of evil. This warfare goes on continuously, and we human beings are caught up in it and can only decide which side to fight on. If God called a person to be a hermit, he was not calling that person away from the battle, but rather further into the battle to be a frontline soldier because the hermit had to allow the struggle between good and evil to be fought out in himself without relying on any human help, but relying only on God. However, if the hermit remained faithful and, as it were, won this spiritual battle, the benefit, the spiritual benefit to the whole church would be enormous. So it was not a selfish ideal, and it certainly wasn't a rest cure. Cuthbert spent nearly nine years here most of that time in splendid isolation, although the monks of Lindisfarne did have to build him a small guest house to receive his many visitors. However, Cuthbert's solitude was not to last forever. In 685 AD, he became the newly elected bishop of Hexham. The chapel that now stands on the farm is of a much later date than Cuthbert's simple cell. If you were a bishop in the Roman Church, you had a diocese, so you had a definite territory that you were fixed to, and you didn't overlap into the next person's territory. If you were a Celtic bishop, quite often you roamed wherever you, you felt the Spirit took you, and you didn't have such a fixed area. I think Cuthbert decided to become a bishop because after he'd first refused, he would have another wrestle with himself and with his God. And the big question would be, God, is this what you want me to do? Not what I want, but what do you want me to do? And I think, sadly for Cuthbert, the conclusion was that this is what he would have to do. It seemed that he was the right man to do it and he was in the right place to move from. When I first came across the Celtic saints, Aidan and Cuthbert stood out. And I, I wanted to know what motivated them. What was it that enabled them to have such impact upon individuals and communities and, and culture itself? And I came to the conclusion that it was a love of Christ 
And uh, that passion and that sense of adventure and, and taking risks for the cause of God were the things that, that uh, were inspirational to us in our own community. We've drawn from their inspiration, not worshipping them, but worshipping the God whom they worshipped, uh, whom we seek to serve as, as they did. Well, St Cuthbert, from the word go, was a man of enormously holy life. I think it's fair to describe him as a living saint. Uh, when he was eventually persuaded to become a bishop, of course, he, the sees of Northumbria were transferred around to allow him to remain at Lindisfarne. And we are told that St Cuthbert himself appreciated this, but the community would have appreciated it even more because the last thing they would have wanted would be to lose their living saint to another part of the country. Cuthbert died here on Inner Farn in 687 AD. The monks that were with him lit torches to signal the news to the waiting community over on Lindisfarne. Although he wanted to be buried here, he finally agreed that his body could be taken back to Lindisfarne, knowing full well that the burial place would become a shrine. However, that was to start a journey that would continue for over 300 years. The really extraordinary thing about Cuthbert for his contemporaries was the fact that his body had been found incorrupt and that was interpreted as a special sign from God that he was an exceptionally holy man. That generated an immediate interest in his cult as a saint and his fame spread very rapidly in Anglo-Saxon England and beyond into early medieval Europe. It was quite obvious, even during his lifetime, that Cuthbert uh, had an aura of sanctity around him. And when he died in 687, uh, his body was buried, as uh, was usual in these cases. But equally, as was usual in these cases, um, some years later, 698, his body was exhumed. Now, at that stage, one would normally have expected the body to have been reduced to a series of bones. And current practice for those who uh, one wanted to turn into saints, as it were, or recognize as saints, uh, was to gather the bones together and set them in a shrine. To the great surprise and the great delight of Lindisfarne monks, Cuthbert's body was found to be incorrupt. Uh, the flesh had not decayed. And so they carried him into the, the church at Lindisfarne and set his incorrupt body in a shrine. And that was the beginnings of the cult of St. Cuthbert. Cuthbert's body began its remarkable journey when the peace and prayer of Lindisfarne was shattered by some unwelcome visitors, the Vikings. In 793 AD, Viking longships were spotted on the horizon. They headed straight for Lindisfarne. Those monks who stayed were either slaughtered or sold into slavery. Bede tells us that the attacks carried on up and down the coastline. Eventually, the situation got so bad that the community on Lindisfarne had had enough. They packed up and left. It is said that the monks first sought refuge in this cave, now known as Cuthbert's Cave. Later, they dismantled the wooden church of St. Peter, collected the relics of Aidan, Cuthbert and Oswald, and took everything to Norham on the Tweed. However, as the Viking raids got worse, they loaded everything onto a cart and set off westwards, with a view to going to Ireland. But they never made it. And in trying, they nearly lost the Lindisfarne Gospels in the sea. Instead, the community of Cuthbert turned their attention back towards Northumbria. The picture which is painted by later Durham tradition in the 12th century is of this small group of wanderers uh, working their way across northern England, uh, oppressed on all sides. That's the picture that's painted in the later Durham sources, but they are in fact romanticising it almost certainly. What they're actually doing is going round their estates going round the lands which actually belong to the Cuthbert community. Later sources tell us that the community of St Cuthbert was forced to flee from its original base on Holy Island and then subsequently after a brief stay at Norham just up the Tweed Valley, considerably further south during the disruptions caused by Viking raids at the end of the 9th century. One reason why they would have chosen Chesley Street in particular is probably because then there may well have been substantial traces of the fort defences, the Roman fort defences, which would have given them some sort of protection in politically unstable times. During the 9th century, the community of St Cuthbert had acquired extensive landed estates in the area of what is now County Durham and one suspects that they were trying very hard to defend those estates 
even if that meant moving Cuthbert's body into the middle of them. And of course, even the Vikings, when they became Christian, were very aware of the power of a saint and uh, the perils of crossing him. So Cuthbert was, in a sense, their, their strongest weapon in attempting to hold on to their lands in the, this part of Northumbria. The Lindisfarne Gospels was written by a monk called Aadfris, whose name is recorded for us in a 10th century colophon in the manuscript itself. And he was a member of the Lindisfarne monastic community. He had known St Cuthbert in his lifetime. Uh, he afterwards became Bishop of Lindisfarne, possibly because he was a craftsman of, of such outstanding merit, and this was something that mattered very much to the Celtic Church. Today, the value of the Lindisfarne Gospels is immeasurable, particularly for students of Anglo-Saxon England, uh, because the manuscript survives. Uh, it is uniquely perfect. It is uniquely splendid. Uh, because we know where and when the manuscript was made within a very, very short period, uh, it is in fact a touchstone for every other 7th and 8th century artefact uh, that has come down to us. There's considerable controversy about the reason for the production of the Lindisfarne Gospels. Some people think they were produced in anticipation of translating Cuthbert's body into his shrine in 698. Other people think that they were produced in response to those events that the community suddenly realised they needed an exceptionally uh, elaborately decorated gospel book for liturgical use in the church after the cult had become established. It's difficult to choose between those alternatives but at any rate, it must date between the very end of the 7th and the first quarter of the 8th century. The manner in which Cuthbert's cult was promoted is actually quite well known to us. In the first place, we possess a remarkable number of early accounts of Cuthbert. We possess two prose lives in Latin, a, a verse life in Latin, and as many as six chapters devoted exclusively to Cuthbert in Bede's ecclesiastical history. So an awful lot of writing went on about Cuthbert by early medieval standards in the first decades of the 8th century. Now, I don't think that writing was accidentally produced. Obviously, Cuthbert was a well-known figure, but there must also have been people who were promoting that writing. Well, the story of the Lindisfarne Gospels is almost as extraordinary as that of the community of St Cuthbert himself. Um, it was at Chesterley Street that the uh, translation into Old English, the native tongue of the members of the community, was first made. This window shows the earlier history of the Gospels, their making by Bishop Eardfrith of Lindisfarne, at the end of the 7th or the beginning of the 8th centuries, and it's clear from analysis of the hand of the manuscript that a single person wrote it and designed all the famous illumination. Bishop Ethelwald of Lindisfarne, heir to this successor, was responsible for binding the manuscript, and Bilfrith the anchorite, you see them both at work in this panel, was actually decorating the cover for the Gospels. It's easy to forget that these books were covered with precious metal and jewelled outer covers for liturgical use in church. Uh, and finally, of course, it would have been taken from Chesterley Street together with the other relics of St Cuthbert to what was its final resting place in the Middle Ages at Durham itself. And so it was that a thousand years ago this year, the relics of St Cuthbert arrived here. There'd been a major promotion of the cult of Cuthbert during those travelling years, and the presence of those relics here at Durham led to the building of the cathedral you now see standing behind me. Here, behind the high altar of Durham Cathedral, is carved a single name on a slab of rock, Cuthbertus. Around the tomb, a small wall was built, reminiscent of the cell on Cuthbert's Isle. Surrounding that, a magnificent cathedral was built as a shrine to house the body of the North's best-loved saint. Today, it is a world heritage site. Cuthbert was brought here a thousand years ago in the year 995, on the last stage of his great journey from Lindisfarne, and was buried here, and a great shrine was built over his burial place so that for a thousand years he's been at the center of our spirituality, so that this cathedral church has been a place of prayer and pilgrimage for a long time, all because of him. He was clearly a holy man who made a great impression on all sorts of people in his day. And 
reading Bede's life of Cuthbert, we have glimpses of the substance of that holiness, and that can be an inspiration to us. He was working in a part of the world that was largely pagan, and many say that we are in that position today. So we get great inspiration from his courage and his bravery, and the very simple way in which he revealed the gospel in what he did and in what he said. From time to time over the centuries, the tomb has been opened and the body of Cuthbert found to be uncorrupt. The last time this happened was in 1827. What Rain found when he opened up the tomb in 1827, uh, very much as far as I can see to his surprise, was that there were clear signs still of a mummified body there. Uh, and the body was more or less intact. Unlike almost any other saint whose bones were scattered across Europe, Cuthbert had remained intact. The saint was a holy person. The, uh, the shrine was a holy place. This was a place where you, in a sense, had access to heaven and to the holy. The saints attracted gifts, gifts of treasures, and also gifts of land. And land was vitally important for the early medieval church. The Cuthbert community, which gradually acquired lands all over Northumberland, Durham, over in Cumbria, down into Yorkshire. The whole basis, really, of the power of the Prince Bishops of Durham in the later period was all built upon a saint who attracted gifts of land. The most important items are the coffin and the little portable altar that was found, and also Cuthbert's pectoral cross, and also some priestly garments, what's called a maniple and a stole, which date uh, a couple of centuries after Cuthbert's time, and a cone too that uh, was found there. And it really is unparalleled in this country, is on display uh, in Durham Cathedral. Durham Cathedral, which in a sense is a great Norman tribute to an Anglo-Saxon saint, the whole building wrapped around that shrine. I think we can learn a number of things from the Celtic saints. There was a depth to their lives. There was a depth of spirituality that sustained them in, in their ministry and their mission. There was an accessibility about the faith that they proclaimed and demonstrated. So as they lived openly among other folk, you didn't have to climb over some church wall or you know, learn a new church language. It was a faith that related to people where they were, challenged the things in society that the gospel would challenge. Uh, it became accessible for people. And it was very vibrant. It was a passionate faith, passionate spirituality. Uh, a love of God, love for people, desire to share his good news to, to the world. But Cuthbert's body does not lie here alone. At this end of the cathedral lies the tomb of a man whose work put the Northeast on the map, the map of New Europe. That man's name is the Venerable Bede, but that, as they say, is another story.